Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, John Brown, um, and I'm just here to speak with you about advancements and treatment options for common sports injuries of the shoulder and knee. Um, briefly, um, I'm one of the founding members of the Core Institute. I've been practicing in Arizona uh, for the past 17 years. Um, it's going to be a long time. Um, I'm a sports medicine trained orthopedic surgeon. I did my fellowship in Santa Monica, California. Um, at, Santa Mo at the Santa Monica Orthopedic uh, Group, we took care of the Pepperdine University as well as the United States Men's and Women's uh, World Cup and Olympic soccer teams. Um, I practice in the North Northwest Valley. Um, currently serve as a team consultant for the Texas Rangers uh, Major League Baseball Club um, and also a team physician for three high school uh, football team or three high school programs here in the Valley. Um, my practice here at CORE, um, I'm a shoulder and knee surgeon. Uh, in the shoulder, I specialize in arthroscopy, rotator cuff repair, shoulder instability, shoulder arthritis to include uh, total shoulder arthroplasty as well as reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Um, and I do um, surgery regarding complex shoulder reconstruction. So I would say in the shoulder, I do everything. Uh, in the knee, uh, my specialty is more sports medicine related specifically, uh, where I perform knee arthroscopy, cartilage restoration, ACL, ligament reconstruction, meniscus surgeries. Um, I do not perform knee replacement procedures. Um, that's handled by our uh, knee, replace, knee replacement specialists, um, which is a separate part of, um, of my practice. The objectives tonight are to induce, introduce several cutting edge concepts related to the advancements uh, in the treatment of injuries of the shoulder and knee. Um, I will define the standard of care of common sports injuries of the shoulder and knee. I'll discuss advancements in techniques and modalities of treatment, evaluate the applicability of these techniques in the current practice of orthopedic surgery, and then finally to discuss the future of treatment of common sports injuries of the shoulder and knee. So, Again, just discussing uh, advancements in the treatment of sports injuries. Generally speaking, uh, just to kind of kick this off, from a repair and uh, reconstruction perspective, the techniques used to repair and reconstruct, reconstruct injured joint tissue is extremely effective. In other words, we have the tools to fix the m multiple modalities of, or the multiple injuries that occur within the shoulder and knee. We can. We have the screws and the, and the sutures and, and all the devices that we need to fix these tissues, and we do that very well. The situation and the question that can be asked is how can we create a situation where that healing is maximized and the failure of the repair or the reconstruction is minimized? So I kind of summarize that and I say the challenge is, is the biology of healing. In other words, how do we improve the biologic milieu of the shoulder or the knee to improve um, that which we have repaired. So the cutting edge concepts that I'll, I'll speak, speak about tonight briefly and then I'll kind of talk, talk about how those are employed in the, in the way that we treat these injuries. Uh, we'll talk about platelet-rich plasma. Uh, we'll talk about bone marrow aspirate, uh, which is a source of uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And we'll also talk about a little about subacromial bursal derived cells, and that's more of a shoulder specific um, uh, source of, of stem cells for, for shoulder related procedures. I'm sure many of you out there have heard of platelet rich plasma. It's a hot topic, it continues to be a hot topic. Um, with a platelet rich plasma, how, that is, how that's performed is the blood is actually drawn from the vein. Um, it's, spun down into a it's spun down in a centrifuge to isolate the platelets specifically. The platelets contain a component called alpha granules, alpha granules that are rich in growth factors. So that's where the, that's where the real um, healing factor of the, of the platelets are, is in those uh, growth factors contained in the alpha granules. The, alpha gran the growth factors themselves are the things that promote healing. So really what platelet-rich plasma is, it's a source of growth factors which improve the healing uh, of a specific body part when, a, when applied effectively. Just remember that there's no stem cells in PRP. That's not our stem cell source. So when, you know, in a, in a marketing 
you know, advertisement or something like that when they talk about PRP, they're not talking about stem cell therapy. The second source of, of uh, healing factors are, uh, is, is, are, is bone marrow aspirate. And bone marrow aspirate is obtained from the individual through a large bore trocar. That's basically a large needle. Um, and that's penetrated or placed within the marrow cavity of the bone. That marrow cavity could be from the pelvis. Uh, it could be from the proximal humerus, which is the upper part of the arm bone. Sometimes it's taken from the tibia. So those are various sources of, of bone marrow uh, for the bone marrow aspirate. The marrow is carefully processed to isolate the stem cells. There's a system in which that marrow aspirate is, is placed in and it isolates the stem cells, which then can be used uh, in a specific orthopedic application. The third uh, option for stem cells, again, shoulder specific. Um, is subacromial bursal derived stem cells. Whenever I'm doing a shoulder arthroscopy, uh, there's a significant amount of bursal tissue, tissue that's present within the operative field. Uh, there are techniques that we can use to harvest these uh, cells, and they're really contained in the fat within, that, within the bursa itself, and we can use those cells then and isolate those cells and then apply them to the uh, to the area that we want to see improved healing. Again, the, the bursal-derived stem cells are specific to the shoulder. And again, harvest, harvesting techniques have been developed to isolate these cells. So we'll start tonight in speaking of, uh, in terms of speaking of sports injuries, we'll start, start tonight with sports injuries of the knee. Um, I'll discuss meniscus tear. Uh, we'll talk about articular cartilage injury and we will also talk about specifically ligament injury, injury specific to the uh, anterior cruciate ligament. Uh, we'll go over a variety of treatment options for these uh, and how we can maximize the healing uh, potential uh, when we take care of these injuries themselves. So the meniscus is a rubbery-like cartilage structure that serves as a cushion in the knee. Um, and that's marked by that arrow on the MRI image that you're seeing on your screen that, um, that denotes the meniscus, um, specifically in a model. Um, this is a model of the knee. So the meniscus is the cartilage cushion that's located between the femur bone and the tibia bone, and this is the meniscal cushion right here. Uh, this is the um, lateral meniscus, and then you have the medial meniscus on this side. Um, and that, again, serves as a cushion between the femur bone and the tibia bone. I make the analogy of the meniscus as like a bushing in a gear. I think it's easy for people to understand that. In general, it does have a limited blood supply. Therefore, it does have limited healing potential. The meniscus tear is a very common injury in the athletic population. It's actually a very common injury to the knee in general. Um, acute injuries typically occur from a twisting load-bearing force. The athlete may be landing from going up for a layup. They land on their foot, transmits the forces uh, through the leg and into the knee and can result in a meniscus tear. Um, they may also occur in, associate, in association with a more devastating injury such as an ACL tear. It's very common to see meniscus tears in association with an ACL tear. They can develop slowly from long-term overuse. Um, they remain asymptomatic, and then they finally cross that pain threshold where they become symptomatic. The individual may present to clinic with an acute onset of knee pain, and they describe um, you know, a, a period where they're out you know, playing basketball several weeks ago, and then the, that, that knee pain then becomes symptomatic, and they present to the clinic. The injury didn't occur two days ago when the pain started, but it actually occurred you know, several weeks ago during that athletic activity, and sometimes it's even more remote than that. Both the medial and lateral meniscus can be affected by, uh, by the meniscus tear. And on your screen, what you're seeing is a, um, uh, an arthroscopic picture of what a meniscus tear looks like. Uh, and then there's the before and after images of that meniscus tear once that meniscus has been taken care of. The goal of meniscus surgery is to eliminate the pain and dysfunction caused by the tear. I always make the analogy, it's taking the pebble out of the shoe. The meniscus tear acts as a 
almost as a foreign body within the knee. Every time you take a step, you actually step on the meniscus itself. In other words, the knee compresses that meniscus tear. And there are nerve endings within, uh, within the cartilage of the knee which uh, create that pain. You take the pebble out of the shoe, you remove that uh, meniscus tear, uh, and that pain goes away. So non-operative treatment of meniscus tears, um, it's, it's a very good option, um, but always remember that the meniscus, a meniscus tear will not heal on its own. They can be treated so they become asymptomatic, however. Um, people will engage in physical therapy. Anti-inflammatory medications do play a role. They actually help significantly in this situation. Um, we also can do uh, cortisone uh, injections for the, to reduce the inflammation. Operative treatment involves arthroscopic meniscectomy um, and also meniscus repair. Uh, there are the, the technologies for the meniscus repair have really accelerated over the past uh, several years. However, once again, the meniscus does have a limited blood supply. So the ability to uh, heal a meniscus once it's torn, even if it is repaired, is sometimes less than optimal. Uh, many times a meniscus repair can be, will be performed and uh, ultimately several years later that meniscus can tear again. So it's, it's still a very challenging uh, part of what we do as sports medicine physicians. Uh, meniscus uh, surgery is a, is a complex process to, to, to get them to heal. Um, some, so in that vein, what are some advances in meniscus tear treatment? Um, I'll just say this, once a tear occurs, again, there's no current treatment that will initiate a healing process. People will ask me, well, can I do platelet-rich plasma? Will that, heal my, will that heal my meniscus tear? Or can I do a bone marrow aspirate? Can I use stem cells to heal the meniscus, meniscus tear? Modalities such as platelet-rich plasma and bone marrow aspirate, or the stem cells, may alleviate the inflammatory process and decrease the pain but they don't and they won't heal the tear. So that tear will still be there. The inflammatory process that occurs because the meniscus, is the meniscus tear is there uh, may be improved. Operative treatment for, for meniscus um, in terms of advances would be the, um, would be the meniscus repair. Um, and in using the PRP and the bone marrow aspirate in those situations, Currently, the evidence that's out there, in other words, if you, if you look in the, in the database or any kind of the studies that are out there, it, the, the evidence is limited, um, but it does hold promise. In other words, I, I always kind of make the, the statement that I think we're uh, in a race to the starting line in terms of using these biologic um, adjuncts, if, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, in terms of, in terms of this healing process. We know that they exist. We know what their biologic components are. Um, we're determining how best to effectively use them in situations such as, in such as this. And that applies really kind of as a broad statement to all the injuries that I'll be talking about tonight. Again, in the laboratory and in preclinical studies, in other words, in animal studies, um, and some of the preclinical studies done in, in, human, in the human model, uh, we have seen some st significant strides. We've been able to figure out how to concentrate different components of those um, of the of the platelet-rich plasma or of the bone marrow aspirate to most effectively use those in these situations. So again, the translation to the clinical application does remain challenging. I will say this in my hands in a repair in a meniscal repair situation, if a product such as PRP is available uh, or a bone marrow aspirate. Uh, I will use it. I think it's a very effective way. If I can increase the chance of that meniscus tear healing by any percentage points, um, I think it's an effective thing to use and I, I will use it. Articular cartilage injury. and articul The articular cartilage is the cartilage that lines the joint. I put up that picture that you're seeing on your screen to denote the, the appearance of what articular cartilage looks like. That knee actually does have an articular cartilage injury. It has been, the articular cartilage injury has been treated with a microfracture, but the surrounding um, glistening white tissue there is the articular cartilage, and that's what lines the joint. So you can see the bone, which has several holes poked in it, the bone, which has several holes poked in it, and the surrounding um, articular cartilage in that image, uh, that's what articular cartilage looks like. So people always kind of wonder, you know, what that looks like, and that's, that's what it is. The articular cartilage can be injured from a direct blow to the knee 
or it can be an association, an, uh, an association with an instability injury such as an ACL tear. There are instances in which people have a genetically, uh, they're genetically predisposed to develop an articular cartilage injury and we call those an osteochondral uh, defect. Um, and we typically see those in, in uh, younger teenagers. The articular cartilage injuries that we're talking about tonight are non-arthritic and they're focal. In other words, they're a, they're a pothole in the road. Um, and these are, these are full thickness defects that actually the entire uh, layer of cartilage is lost off the, uh, off the end of the bone and we actually see an area of exposed bone. Um, the image that you're seeing, again, is an articular cartilage defect of a specific portion of the knee. Uh, we are not talking about diffuse cartilage loss. Uh, we're not talking about bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. Uh, that, uh, that is treated with a total knee arthroplasty, not these techniques. So the treatment uh, for these articular cartilage defects, um, non-operative treatment could be non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, corticosteroid injections can help reduce, again, the inflammation. And in many cases, uh, they may be in asymptomatic. Uh, the analogy is, is a big tire over a small pothole. If that tire is big enough and goes over a pothole that's small enough, they won't even know that that hole exists in the road. And the same thing happens with the knee. Um, it just, and, and that's why they, became, they become asymptomatic, or they can be asymptomatic. Operative treatment is performed when they are symptomatic. The old school way of treating uh, articular cartilage defect is, what we, is a um, procedure called microfracture. And this is an interesting concept. What, what is done is um, several small holes are made in the, in the bone and that draws the bone marrow, um, which contains mesenchymal stem cells, into that cartilage defect. And these cells accumulate and they form a cartilage-like scar over the defect. This does not regrow normal cartilage. It actually forms a, a cartilage scar over the defect, but typically that's enough to um, reduce the symptoms of the, of the articular cartilage injury. New school techniques, um, we fix the defect when possible. Um, there is a technique that, that uses bioabsorbable compression screws. Uh, this holds the fragment in place until it actually heals back down to the bone. So, in a younger individual that sustains an articular cartilage injury, and that's what you're seeing on those images at the bottom of the screen, that articular cartilage has actually peeled off the bone, and then what we've done in an open procedure is put that back like a puzzle piece and fixed it with screws which are called biocomposite or bioabsorbable compression screws. And those bioabsorbable bio compression screws eventually dissolve over time but it takes them long, it, the, the length of time it takes them for, the, for them to dissolve is longer than it takes for that uh, area to heal. And you can see on those two images a very nice repair of that articular cartilage injury. New school techniques also are um, techniques in which car cartilage is actually harvested uh, from the knee. Um, the defect is inspected at that time. That's the first stage of the procedure. Um, what happens next is that cartilage is actually sent to a lab and that lab then grows the cartilage. So it amplifies the number of the cartilage cells and then a sample is sent back to the surgeon and then a second stage operation is performed where that defect is filled with the newly grown cartilage cells. Um, there's multiple different techniques all based on the same principles uh, for this. Uh, this is not foolproof. It still doesn't grow back with normal cartilage. Again, it's more of a uh, fibro cartilage. It's more of a stiffer cartilage. It's not for the arthritic knee. Again, we can't regrow enough cartilage to resurface an arthritic knee. This is diffuse cartilage loss with bone on bone defects, so it's not effective in those situations. Another new school technique is what's called an osteochondral allograft. This has gained a lot of momentum over the past several years. Um, What's nice about this, it's an instant coverage of the cartilage defect. Um, the, uh, the cartilage is actually, the cartilage and bone plug is actually harvested from a uh, cadaver. Um, this is then transplanted, transplanted planted into the defect of the patient. You get new cartilage and an instant fill of the defect. 
The series of pictures that you're seeing are um, surgical images where the defect is uh, present. Uh, the cartilage harvest is then being performed. The uh, recipient site is then prepared. And in the top right portion of the screen are the two donor plugs that were put in that very large defect on this individual. Um, and uh, this works out very nicely in, in these situations. The role of PRP in stem cells in this situation, um, it probably does play a role in improved healing. Um, there's no evidence-based randomized controlled studies that clearly supports its use. However, again, if available, I'll use it. Um, and typically what is done is it's, it's usually a PRP um, where the bone plug or the cartilage themselves are soaked, uh, soaked in the platelet-rich plasma. And then once, it's, once the uh, platelet-rich plasma is absorbed into the, uh, in the osteochondral allograft, that's when it's implanted. So um, again, if it does help improve the healing process, I think it's a good thing to use. We'll move on to ACL tear. So the ACL is the athlete's stability ligament. Um, it's one of those injuries that occur at a spur of the moment. They've, the athlete has done the exact same thing thousands and thousands of times over. So it functions perfectly until that one moment when it does tear. Uh, typically, this is a non-contact twisting change of direction injury. Uh, the athlete feels a shift and a pop in the knee uh, they present in clinic with a swollen knee. They describe the situation where they were simply making a cutting motion on the field of play, and they felt their knee give way uh, and immediately felt a pop and immediate pain in the knee. Uh, and then they present to clinic for further evaluation. In an ACL tear, if the athlete wants to get back to play or back to pre-injury level, there's really no role for conservative treatment. Um, an ACL will not heal on its own, um, and that's documented on an MRI. So an MRI is typically obtained once the patient comes in uh, following an injury such as this. We obtain an MRI, determine that there is an ACL tear. Um, Platelet-rich plasma and or bone marrow aspirates stem cells will not heal an ACL tear. The recommendation is surgical reconstruction. In the bottom of your screen, you're seeing a normal ACL. And then in the other surgical picture, that is a torn ACL. So there's no way for that ACL to reconstitute uh, within the knee and form a normal ligament. So reconstruction is the recommendation. So the treatment um, is ar arthroscopic assisted anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. Um, and the big discussion that we have at that point in time, once we make the decision to move forward with surgery, is really graft choice. In other words, what, what graft are we going to use to reconstruct this athlete's knee? There's two main kind of big picture options in this. There's the autograft, which is the patient's own tissue, and then there's allograft, which is cadaver tissue. Typically in my younger athletes, I recommend an autograft. Um, it's their own tissue. They're, we can't get anything better than that. Um, and in the older population, I would probably say old is a relative term, but probably 35 years of age and, and older um, cadaver tissue or allograft tissue is recommended. And there's, a, there's certainly a gray area in that if there's a 35, 40 year old individual that wants to use their own tissue, um, I think an, an autograft is certainly a very reasonable choice. Um, the reason why the, the allograft is, is better as, you, as we get a little older, there's much less what we call surgical morbidity in, the, um, in using an allograft. It's an easier procedure for the, for the indi individual to recover from. A lot of times they're still, they have a job, they need to get back. They can't take the time to recover from, from, what, uh, from the same type of procedure that's done when an autograft tissue is used. So the different options for uh, autograft, in other words, the patient's own tissue, um, are uh, quadriceps tendon. Uh, bone patella tendon bone and uh, hamstring. So again, in, the, in, in this, the quadriceps tendon is, is taken from the top portion of the, of, the, of the above the knee here, and then a bone patella tendon is taken through this, and the hamstring are, are tendons that insert over here on the side of the knee, uh, and those, those we can take. They're not present, obviously, in this model, but that's another option. Um, the 
new school, I mean, I would consider this new school is really use the use of the quadriceps tendon autograft. Uh, for a very long period of time, the bone patella tendon bone and hamstring were kind of going hand in hand. And the quadriceps tendon autograft is, um, is really kind of taken off in, in recent years. Uh, the reason is, is there's minimal donor site morbidity. Um, when we do this quadricep tendon autograph, what we're able to do, as opposed to the, other, uh, to the two other uh, procedures, which are the bone patella tendon bone and the hamstring, we're able to actually repair that quadriceps tendon uh, harvest site. If we've taken bone, we can bone graft that harvest site, which then grows new bone. Um, so it's, aside from the scar uh, that's, that's on the skin, it's as if we were never there. Um, as opposed to the bone patella tendon bone or the hamstrings, if you remove the hamstrings, the hamstrings are gone. And in the uh, bone patella tendon bone autograft, uh, it leaves a defect in the kneecap and, the, and some of the other structures in the knee. The quadriceps tendon autograft can be done uh, with all inside techniques with minimal incisions. Again, the harvest site is repaired. Um, it is a thick, robust graft. Um, with the quadriceps tendon autograft, I get a predictable graft every single time. Um, and I can make adjustments based on patient size. The graft size is not determined by the graft that I'm able to harvest. I'm able to harvest that same size graft on, on each and every patient. I do soak the tendon in platelet-rich plasma prior to implantation. Uh, blood is drawn from the patient prior to the surgery. And once that graft is harvested, prior to me placing it within the patient uh, themselves, we soak that graft uh, in platelet-rich plasma in order for it to absorb as much of that platelet-rich plasma as possible. And then once implanted, the graft is actually injected with the platelet-rich plasma. So we kind of maximize the use of the platelet-rich plasma uh, in those situations. We'll move on now to sports injuries of the shoulder. Um, we'll specifically talk about rotator cuff tear. Um, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of the shoulder dislocation or labral tear. Uh, the rotator cuff tear, I think, is a, is a pretty comprehensive discussion. So the rotator cuff is a pulley system that provides concentric motion to the shoulder. Um, I've brought a model up here to kind of show exactly what that rotator cuff looks like. Uh, this is a model of the shoulder. This is the clavicle here. You're looking at the shoulder from the front. Um, there are four main tendons that make up the rotator cuff, uh, and these tendons are the, uh, the subscapularis tendon here in the front, the supraspinatus tendon comes over the top, and the infraspinatus tendon is in the, um, is in the back, and then down low is the teres minor tendon. So all of these create a cuff of tissue that surrounds the uh, top part of the proximal humerus. Uh, the humeral head. I'm going to remove this one here so you guys can get a better image of that. Um, and so again, this is the supraspinatus tendon. This is the one that's most commonly injured and sometimes it does involve the infraspinatus tendon here. So you can imagine these are, it's a pulley system. So the muscle pull is in this direction, <coughs> which then pulls on the tendon, which then pulls on the bone, which allows that shoulder to come up. So that's why I describe it as a pulley system. I think people can understand that. Um, what happens in the, um, in the rotator cuff is it can, the injuries can occur kind of slowly over time, and we call those attritional injuries. In other words, over time, they, uh, they eventually just wear out. There's, there's a um, kind of what we call a watershed area of blood supply at the attachment of the rotator cuff, which means that there's sometimes a limited blood supply. So any injuries that occur here um, have, a, have, have less potential to heal secondary to the blood supply issue. They can occur all at once. In other words, if an individual falls, there's a force that's directed on the humerus, which then pistons the proximal humerus into that rotator cuff, which causes this muscle to pull back. And this is what a tear would look like where that tendon is actually pulled off the bone and this is its normal insertion site. So our job is to pull that tendon back out and repair it back down to the bone. The most commonly injured uh, rotator cuff tendon, once again, is the supraspinatus tendon, which is right here uh, in, this, in this model. The diagram that you're seeing at the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the screen is a tear of the supraspinatus tendon. 
and you're looking at that end on and so you're seeing that tendon pulled back and you're seeing that gap in the bone. So I tell people that when I look at the, when I'm looking at this rotator cuff tear, the visualization is if I'm on top of the roof and I'm looking down into the living room, there's a hole in the roof and I can see right down into the living room and that's what, we're, what you're seeing on that image right there. You're seeing into the house, so to speak, from, an, from a metaphorical uh, perspective. The injury to the rotator cuff may result in activity associated pain or even chronic pain. I would say that there's probably a population out there that has a rotator cuff tear and they may not even be aware of it. The most typical presentation is, is the patient will come to me and discuss what's the biggest issue? Nighttime pain. Um, it keeps them up at night. They have pain with overhead, reaching, and behind the back activities. Um, athletes seek attention for shoulder pain when the pain prevents them from participating effectively in sports or with their everyday day-to-day uh, -day activities. When a patient presents with the, this series of components, uh, they failed conservative treatment, um, we order an MRI and these, the MRI is diagnostic of a, of a rotator cuff tear. Treatment options for rotator cuff tears. Um, physical therapy, non anti-inflammatory medications, and cortisone shots are kind of the mainstay. Um, insurance companies certainly like us to participate in this type of, um, in these modalities, um, and, and sometimes they are effective. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a reasonable thing to try if a patient is not, um, uh, is not very anxious to move forward with a surgical intervention. Uh, then we can certainly try physical therapy, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, and, and cortisone shots. This is, I say this every time, with this type of modality, it will make the pain go away, but it will not, and it won't heal the tear. The tear will do one of two things. It's either going to stay the same, or it's going to get worse. If it stays the same, and they're able to deal with that pain, then a follow-up MRI in about six months is a reasonable thing to do to assess any kind of progression of that tear. Um, if it is getting worse, once again, um, it's, a, it's recommended that it be fixed. There are instances in which a rotator cuff tear occurs. It is diagnosed. The patient decides not to repair it. Um, an MRI is uh, they are lost to follow up. They come back a year later. We get a repeat MRI of that shoulder and the rotator cuff has torn so significantly that it is, un it is unable to be fixed with standard techniques. So it can create a uh, a more complex situation through, um, through benign neglect, so to speak. Operative treatment is the, is, is the mainstay of addressing rotator cuff tears. Um, old school treatment was open repair, um, which makes an incision through the deltoid muscle. Um, the deltoid muscle covers the, um, the side of the shoulder and an incision needs to be made in that muscle in order to effectively approach uh, that rotator cuff. That rotator cuff is then tied back down to the bone through a series of sutures, bone anchors, uh, whatever the choice may be uh, per the sur surgeon's uh, choice. New school arthroscopic repair and that's performed through three to four small keyhole incisions. Um, the beauty of arthroscopy in my hands is I get to see everything. So no stone unturned. People have anxiety when they're going into, a, into an operation. Is the doctor gonna be able to see everything that's wrong with my shoulder? Is he going to be, a, be able to effectively treat you know, what's wrong with my shoulder? Is he gonna miss anything? Um, we do a thorough arthroscopic investigation of the shoulder. Um, we know what normal looks like, we know what abnormal looks like. In order to know abnormal, you have to know what normal looks like. So experience is certainly a key in that. Um, when something is wrong, as you go through the course of the arthroscopy, that can be addressed. Um, the bone spurs are removed, the arthritis is cleaned up, and the rotator cuff is repaired back to bone. Um, the new school rotator cuff repair is what we call double row technique. In double row technique, we use a, typically four separate anchors uh, to create a very robust, uh, we like to call it bulletproof repair, um, where that tendon is then sewn back down to bone. 
This is an arthroscopic image of exactly what I'm talking about. The top left image is the tear. The middle image there is the, uh, are the two anchors that are placed in the bone initially. The sutures are then passed through the rotator cuff. And the bottom picture there is the final repair. Once that repair is, uh, is performed, the clock starts ticking on the healing process. So um, it takes about six weeks for a rotator cuff tear to heal. And that means that those sutures that are holding that rotator cuff down to bone are no longer necessary. The sutures do stay in there. They are non-absorbable. They do not come out. The anchors do not come out, but the anchors are made of what we call a biocomposite material and they eventually turn into bone over time. It takes a while, but they're not, they're non-metallic, um, and they will uh, eventually incorporate into the surrounding bone. The first six weeks, once again, is the healing time. Once the six weeks are up, um, then it's time to start the shoulder moving. Again, once that healing time is up, it does not mean that the individual is ready to perform normal day-to-day -day activities. Once it heals, it has to mature. So then it goes through a maturation process. So there's the healing phase, and then there's the maturation phase, which I also couple with rehabilitation phase. So while the, while the individual is going through the maturation phase, they're also performing uh, physical therapy, which they're strengthening their shoulder, they're, they're beginning to move their shoulder, they're getting their normal range of motion. So the first three months are relatively kind of a pain in the butt, to be honest with you, in terms of getting through that recovery. In, in total, it takes about four to six months for patients to kind of reach, their, uh, reach the point where they're effectively healed. It probably tends more towards the six month mark uh, where, where they're able to get back to all their normal activities. From a uh, return to sport perspective, um, in terms of rotator cuff repairs, um, in golfers, usually I have them start pitching and putting around the nine, uh, nine week mark and then they go on a return to golf in a uh, return to golf in a uh, green to tee fashion where they start their pitching and putting and then they advance to their short irons or mid-range irons and then their long irons and then finally their drivers after about two months. So that puts them at about four months before they're playing a, uh, a full round of golf. Um, for my overhead throwing athletes, um, it's a little bit of a longer period of time. I always make the analogy, um, people can understand this, if I fix a rotator cuff in a, in a police officer, I don't let them back on the streets until about, uh, about uh, five to six months after that rotator cuff has been, uh, has been fixed, just to maximize the, the healing of that tendon and allow them get, to get back to full activity. Further new school treatments in terms of rotator cuff repairs are augments for repairs. And these are what we call biologic collagen scaffolds. Um, these are simply augments to that rotator cuff. The body incorporates these scaffolds. They are a naturally occurring biologic um, strengthening device, so to speak, that, that helps in the healing of a, of a rotator cuff. I usually do use these in a, in a situation where the tendon quality is, is compromised or uh, if that repair is at risk. Uh, situations such as a large to a massive rotator cuff tear, which is a tear that involves two or more tendons. Uh, we'll also use those biologic augments in uh, chronic uh, retracted stiff tendon situations where the repair can be compromised uh, by the quality of tissue itself. More new school um, applications in the shoulder specifically, um, more so in the knee. Um, the technology of the, of the biologics, um, uh, such as PRP, bone marrow aspirate, uh, bone marrow aspirate and the uh, subacromial stem cells are gaining popularity in the treatment of complex rotator cuff repairs. Um, there are actually several well-controlled studies that are demonstrating a definitive benefit to the use of biologic augmentations. Um, we are using them in specific situations now, and I think as we move forward, uh, with this technology that they will become more mainstream. Again, you gotta, everybody has to remember that these biologic augments do come with an expense. Um, and the expense not only comes from just the, the process of harvesting, but also the research that has been done on them and the technology that is used to, to, to harvest these uh, specific entities. 
In my opinion, I think they will become a critical part of our armamentarium uh, in the near future. In regards to the, there's an entity that we talk about in, in rotator cuff, ish, uh, rotator cuff tears is, uh, is what we call massive irreparable rotator cuff tear. So not every tear can be repaired. Um, and there are certainly situations when you go into a rotator cuff repair where you kind of have that knowledge already. There are situations in which you go into a rotator cuff repair in which that you are expecting to be able to repair that tendon and you know you get into that situation that and that rotator cuff just can't be mobilized effectively uh, to be able to repair it. And just I'll kind of demonstrate on this model. A typical repair can be pulled back you know one or two centimeters if that tear is pulled back four to five centimeters, it becomes so stiff that it can't be mobilized back to the bone interface right there. So we just can't pull it back down. And that creates a chronic gap in that rotator cuff where we have ex this exposed area of the humerus and that, and that rotator cuff cannot be mobilized back to the, to the bone. So this is what we call a massive irreparable rotator cuff tear. It typically involves the supraspinatus, which is the tendon across here, and the infraspinatus tendon, which is again the one in the back, uh, and that will be pulled off as well. Um, so these, there's a couple new technologies that are gaining traction in this situation. Uh, the first one is what we call superior capsular reconstruction, and that's actually where we use cadaver dermis. So that's skin tissue uh, we actually use that to, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, to fill in the gap. Um, and we reconstruct the rotator cuff. So the image that you're seeing, the, 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 uh, the drawing that you're seeing there is actually the, what, that, uh, what that superior capsular reconstruction looks like um, on an image base. And it's fixed in two specific spots. And it basically creates a, um, a barrier uh, across the top of the proximal humerus, um, which reconstructs the kind of the function of the rotator cuff. It doesn't serve as a necessarily as a pulley system, uh, but it creates the buttonholing of that of the uh, of the upper part of the arm bone from uh, coming out of the gap created by that rotator cuff. And what you're seeing on the uh, on the arthroscopic images there is you're seeing that gap in the uh, in the rotator cuff, you're seeing directly into the ball and socket joint. And the picture below has been treated with the superior capsular reconstruction. So we have actually filled in that gap with that human dermis tissue uh, in that situation. This is a, uh, a complex surgery. It takes a lot of time to do. The recovery from this surgery is similar to the recovery uh, that's involved with recovery from a rotator cuff repair. Uh, it's probably more so on the seven to eight month um, uh, time frame in terms of recovering from this. So if an individual is not going to have the patience to, to perform, to, to move forward with that type of recovery, um, yeah, this isn't necessarily an indicated surgery. If they are, I think it's very effective. The the, the newest technology that's now on the market is what we call a, the Stryker in-space balloon. Uh, this was recently FDA approved. It's been used in Europe probably over the past 12 years with, with very beneficial results. Um, the indications for this implant are similar to that of the uh, superior capsular reconstruction where you have a massive rotator cuff tear minimal to no arthritis, and a functional arm. If someone has a rotator cuff tear that is bad enough that they can't move their arm uh, in a forward elevation motion, in other words, they're what we call pseudoparalytic. And pseudoparalytic just means they're not necessarily paralyzed, but because that rotator cuff is torn, in other words, the pulley system is not functional, they're not able to move their arm. So they'll come in and present with an arm that, you know, they can't even, they can't move it up. Um, in that situation, it's a different um, situation in terms of what the surgical indication is. In someone that is a candidate for the in-space, they would be able to move their arm up above the level of their shoulder, and the in-space balloon is indicated. This is a balloon implant, 
and what it does is it fills the gap created by the tear, similar to the superior capsular reconstruction where we filled the gap uh, with a uh, piece of cadaver skin. We are filling the gap with a balloon and that balloon creates a cushion between the, uh, between the acromion, which is the bone here, and the ball. So that balloon fills this space right here. So it creates a spacer between the bone called the acromion and the top of the uh, humerus right here. So it fills this gap. And that's what you're seeing on this image here. The bottom left is how the device is, uh, is what the device looks like. Um, the expanded gray material is actually the, blue it, the balloon itself. So that balloon is inserted in that top picture. It's rolled up and that's the insertion device. And then once it's inside the shoulder, it's filled with normal saline and it spreads out and covers the gap. So the other two pictures that you're seeing um, is the inflated balloon uh, covering the gap created by that massive rotator cuff tear. So it's essentially a spacer, a cushion, a depressor of the humeral head so it doesn't rise up and the, the individual is unable to move their arm fluidly through a range of motion uh, with minimal to no pain. Um, some caveats to this uh, specific implant. It is a pain improver, uh, a pain reliever. Um, it is not a strength improver. So it, it typically will improve pain, but it's not gonna necessarily restore strength in that individual. Um, and so that's just something that uh, individuals need to be aware of um, when they're discussing this uh, situation. And to be honest with you, any of the procedures, whether it's a superior capsule reconstruction or a balloon implant, or even the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, which I perform very frequently, um, those are limited in their ability to restore strength. Uh, range of motion is the key, and pain uh, improvement, uh, pain relief is also the secondary part of why we do these. So I'll kind of wrap this up. Um, so the specialty of orthopedics is, is ever-changing in an effort to provide uh, the best care for our patients. The current state provides exceptional results. In other words, what we do on a day-to-day -day pace, uh, day -day basis in terms of taking care of patients, it's just a, it's a very rewarding um, career to be able to do because we're able to make people better. Um, and again, that's why I say we, what we do provides exceptional results. It's not foolproof. Um, it's not... 100% effective every single time, um, but we honestly, we do our best. But can we do better? I think we can, I think we can do better. Um, the new horizon of orthopedics will of course be focused on product improvement. Um, the in-space device for, uh, for example is a product improvement. It's a product innovation that is improving the lives of others through a minimally invasive uh, procedure. The new frontier is harnessing and mastering the biology of healing. We talked about having the necessary implants which are, which are out there. Of course, again, there's gonna be improvements, but how do we make the human body heal better? That's where our challenge is, and I think that's where we're going in terms of the advancement of treatment uh, for sports injuries. So thank you very much, I appreciate your time. Generally not. Um, as as PRP starts to kind of move into the forefront, um, and there are multiple studies that are showing some, uh, that are defining, defining its clinical efficacy. In other words, once it kind of reaches that threshold where, honestly, where insurance companies say, this is an effective treatment, it's gonna make these patients better. Um, once that happens, I think it's gonna become part of the, uh, part of it, a covered insurance policy. Um, right now, the, there's multiple studies out there that are, that are trying to define that and to, to quantify the effectiveness of PRP uh, so PRP can become a, a covered uh, entity. Most of the time, I'm not going to say it's not, but for in general, it's not a uh, covered insurance um, technique. Um, 
In space is probably being done by a small percentage of the uh, orthopedic surgeons here in Arizona. Um, I don't know a specific number. Um, we've been to several conferences where we've discussed the use of in space, and I think over time, as we see the effectiveness of the uh, procedure, that the the usage will most likely will most likely increase. the The risk of what this product will do, and, and this tends to happen with new product development, is that the product itself may become overused. Uh, and so we will see more failures than we should because the, um, because the product itself is not used in the correct clinical applications. So again, if, if you're considering you know, this type of procedure, uh, go to a surgeon that, that specializes in this type of procedures and they will be able to effectively evaluate you uh, and determine whether or not you're a candidate for the in-space procedure. Um, there's two types of kind of weight training uh, that I kind of counsel my patients on. I think once the patient has gone through the effective uh, rehabilitation, they're basically pain-free. And that's somewhere between, again, that four to five month mark. I'll let them start doing um, more machine work where they can control the range of motion. They control the position of their, of their hand and shoulder during a, uh, during a lifting motion. Uh, and so usually it's machine work at about four to five months. Um, and then we can start doing some uh, more free weight training at around the six to eight month mark. <laughs> um, everybody has different uh, sensation or kind of senses of what their, uh, what their pain level is. Um, there are those that ignore their pain and they come in when it's almost too late. But I would say, just to kind of give you a general, uh, general sense of it, if you experience a shoulder injury and it is an incapacitating injury, um, then I would probably try to come in as soon as possible. If you experience kind of more of a slow onset of shoulder pain, um, uh, it keeps you up at night a little bit, then do a trial of anti-inflammatory medications. Um, sometimes that shoulder pain will be gone in three to four weeks. Um, if it's not gone by about six weeks and you feel like it's getting worse, uh, then certainly, you know, uh, employ our services to take a look at you. Depends on what the pathology is. In other words, what exactly is wrong with the rotator cuff? Um, if it's a uh, tendonitis, um, just an inflammation of the tendon itself, then generally continued use will not necessarily injure it further, um, but it will just kind of continue, continue the pain. Um, in that situation, it's always a good idea to get it evaluated, um, uh, get an MRI of the shoulder to determine exactly what the pathology is uh, and then get it effectively treated. If you have a rotator cuff tear, um, and a known rotator cuff tear, continued use during the, doing the same things that injured in the first place will most likely make it worse. Female athletes do have a higher incidence of ACL tears, uh, and that's, that's st statistically significant. Um, you know, we have a the, the female soccer athlete is kind of notorious for presenting for the, for the ACL tear. So, um, you know, we've developed several different uh, training programs that we, they're, they're pre-participation pre training programs. They're actually uh, in-season uh, training programs. And it's a series of exercises and drills that are designed to um, decrease. It's not going to eliminate. There's no way we can eliminate that. Uh, designed to decrease the incidence of ACL tears in, in female athletes. Just one more thing about the ACL. Um, you know, people wonder, you know, why does it happen to specific individuals? I mean, we have the, the elite of the elite in the football athletes, you know, that, that train on a day-to-day -day basis. And in preseason or during season, they're tearing their ACLs. So um, it, regardless of kind of that level, the injury is, is unfortunately going to happen. If we play sports at the level in which we play, 
um, then an ACL tear in those high-level athletes is certainly a is certainly a risk. Again, depends on what the pathology is. My, there are some physicians which will limit the amount of steroid injections that are done. Um, I, I kind of say it like this. If you're coming in every three months or every six months and you're getting a steroid shot to treat a specific problem and that effectiveness of that steroid shot is decreasing over time, it's time to get it fixed. Um, it, it is, and for those that are unable to Per, go through a surgery for medical reasons or um, various other reasons that they're not able to have surgery, then, uh, then they can have steroid shots. I, I would say at a, ma at a minimum or a maximum, however you want to kind of look at it, once every four months, once every three months is probably the most that I would do. Um, but that's, that's, that's kind of the spectrum of how I think about steroid injections. So we talked about this a little bit before in terms of insurance covering PRP. So the, the three different non-operative modalities of arthritis are the corticosteroid injections, and then we have visco supplementation, which we didn't really talk about tonight, but that's otherwise known as joint fluid replacement treatment, and then PRP. Um, the durability of the steroid shot versus, in other words, how long it lasts, steroid shot versus visco supplementation, we probably see a, a better result with the visco supplementation. What we're seeing now in the, in the research that's done with PRP in terms of treatment of arthritis is, is the PRP is, it seems to be outlasting even the durability of what the visco supplementation is doing. And so um, most likely over time that the PRP will become a covered treatment for arthritis as we are seeing that it is, it is becoming effective. I can't, I'm not promising anything, but that trend seems to be moving in that direction. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's a defined program. It's the uh, pre-participation program for, typical for female athletes. And again, I don't have a diagram of it any, or anything like that, but it's a series of exercises that are done um, uh, before practice um, several times a week, which strengthen the specific muscles that, are, uh, that prevent the, uh, the specific motion of the knee that causes the ACL tear. Um, the, the first step in that kind of answer is, is determining exactly why they're still in pain. So if it was a rotator cuff repair and that rotator cuff is, they're still having symptoms of the rotator cuff tear, uh, then an MRI uh, is, is typically used to evaluate the status of the rotator cuff. If it's simply a, an inflammation of the, of the bursa and surrounding rotator cuff, then a corticosteroid injection can be a very effective way to treat that. Um, if there's chronic, what we call tendinopathy, meaning uh, the tendon itself is just chronically inflamed, then the PRP can be a good option to, 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 to effectively treat that. If it's an ACL reconstruction, the ACL reconstruction specifically, the ACL itself is not the pain generator. Uh, many times there's uh, other factors that are involved in terms of generating the pain. And again, that needs to be evaluated by x-ray and by ancillary studies such as, a, such as an MRI before, and, you know, before doing a PRP. My biggest concern with the PRP is, is that you know, patients or individuals uh, really kind of are looking at it as a uh, kind of a solve-all modality. Um, I think it is effective. I think it does have its, its use. Uh, but it's not a panacea um, that we'd like it to be. Um, again, as we do more research into it, as we kind of determine its healing factors and how to utilize those healing factors, I think what it's used for, how it's used, and the effectiveness of it uh, will certainly improve over time. We're just trying to harness that.